Alright, welcome back to the channel, it's great to have you here. In today's video, we've got the best part of the table making series today because in this video we're going to be putting everything together. That's right, it's the assembly part of the table making series. This was my favourite part of the project. I love making the whole table, but I love seeing it all come together, so this should be a great video. Make sure you watch the whole video because I put some tips in there, so hopefully you learn something. And yeah, I've narrated over the whole thing to tell you what I'm doing as I go along. As always, if you want to watch any of the other parts in this series, all the links to those videos are in the description down below, so check them out if you want to. If you're new to this channel and you enjoy this video, make sure you subscribe. If you like the video, give it a like. And if you've got any questions about this table or anything really, just comment down below and I will reply to all your comments. So without further ado, I hope you enjoyed this video. Let's get straight into it. So for part one of the table making series, I made these legs and I left that video with me using a parting tool uh, to mark out the length on each of the leg. And what I'm doing now is just cutting off the end bits that I left on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> dreading to see that. What? I'm dreading to see that. I will put it in the video. Now the reason I left those caps on and I didn't take them off was because of transport. I wanted to leave that sacrificial piece of wood on the top just in case I knocked the leg on a wall or bumped it into something. That sacrificial piece of wood would get dinged and you know knocked around instead of the actual leg. But now I'm ready to glue it onto the table. I need to take off that top. What I'm using is just a crosscut saw to remove the top. Ideally I should have made that that gap where the, I use the parting tool a bit bigger so it would have been easy to cut off. I had to be pretty accurate to get it straight but it wasn't the end of the world and uh, what I used to take down the middle was a chisel. I could use a block plane but I didn't want to use a block plane because I, I didn't want to uh, plane any of the outside of the leg at all. I just wanted to remove the middle and using a chisel I could be a bit more accurate. I also wanted to undercut it a bit like a dovetail. I wanted the middle of the leg to be a bit lower than the outside so when I glue the cap on uh, there'll be no gap around the outside at all and there'll be a really nice join. So what I'm doing now is I'm making the caps on the top of the legs. I'm using Paduk like I used on the bottom of the legs for the socks so there'll be a really nice match and uh, uh, the colours of this table I really like. It's red and white and I think it really works well together. Now I just cut it on the bandsaw and now I'm ripping it in half on the Wadkin rip saw. Now that doesn't leave a nice finish so I've got to put it through the thickness sander to get uh, a nice smooth surface ready for the laser cutter. Now I don't use the laser cutter a lot but we have one at uni so I wanted to try it out. I'm using the laser cutter just to engrave my logo on the table, not to cut out the pieces, it's just uh, a way of signing the table off for me. Normally I add a bit of carving into a piece but I'm not going to do that this time. I just want to uh, really neatly laser engrave my logo on top of one of the legs and that leg is going to be the back right leg so it's a bit discreet but when you know it's there you'll be able to spot it and I think it's a really nice addition. So I'm roughly cutting them oversized on the bandsaw and sanding them on the disc sander, still oversized because later I'm going to use a flush trim bit uh, once it's glued onto the leg to router it back to the final size and I also did a bit of hand sanding. I actually really liked how the uh, laser engraved logo came out. Because I laser engraved it on Paduke it sort of looked hand carved, it just uh, engraved it. There was no visible burning or anything. If I lasered it onto the maple, then uh, the logo will be a black cutter because it would have burnt it onto the wood and it would sort of look like a branding, which was the effect I didn't want. I wanted it to look, you know, engraved in or, or carved and doing it on a dark wood like Paduke, uh, that really worked well. So when I get to that bit, I'll show you the the, the logo and how it looks on the Paduk, I think it comes out really nicely. And as you can see here, I'm gluing the caps on top of the legs and I'm just using masking tape uh, to clamp it down. It didn't really need much more than that. Um, 
it didn't really need a big clamp going from the top and bottom. Masking tape has enough strength to uh, glue it on. That, as you can see, is oversized. And uh, later on, I used a very small flush trim bit to uh, router it back to uh, the final circumference of the leg. Now it's the next day and I'm taking the masking tape off. There you can see my logo, um, sort of. I need to find a better picture to show you coming up. Uh, but now I'm using the flush trim bit. Now I kept on doing a little bit, turning the leg and doing another little bit. I didn't want to take off too much because I really didn't want this to chip out. I actually in some areas had to move the route a bit in the opposite direction, in the wrong direction on purpose because um, the way the grain is going, if I went one direction all the way around, at some point the grain will split out. So I went very carefully uh, in some areas going the opposite direction, taking a very small amount of wood off. So there was no risk of the, the router bit catching. And in the end, uh, it came out very nicely. As you can see there, I added some masking tape around the legs so that uh, the bearing on the router bit didn't mar the wood. Now, I didn't actually need to do this because I found the router bit was uh, very sharp and uh, actually a good quality router bit, so the bearing was directly in line with the cutters, sometimes cheaper router bits. Uh, the bearing mars the wood or the cutters are too, uh, are actually bigger than the bearing. But because this was a good quality router bit, I found that I could take the masking tape off and get right up close uh, to the wood and yeah that wasn't an issue in the end. I still did some hand sanding uh, because I wanted to match the finish on the rest of the leg uh, so in the end the whole leg ended up being I think 320 grit. And as you can see uh, that is the cap all flush trimmed and it's come out very neatly but I wanted to add a chamfer on the top and I did this in a few passes as you can see here this was the first pass which was very small, I was taking a really small amount of material off and then I uh, raised the route a bit up a bit to cut more off and uh, in the end uh, I got quite a heavy chamfer to match the chamfer on the side rails and the curved rails so all the chamfers are the same size throughout this piece uh, which is a nice thing to have And now I'm actually making a jig uh, so that I can cut the profile on the end of the curved rails. This is quite a simple jig. Uh, what I did was just cut out these uh, kind of track curve segments and this was to support the curve. Uh, that arc that I'm cutting on the bandsaw matched the outside curve of the rails. And once all those pieces were cut I sanded on the bobbin sander a bit and then uh, I glued them down to a piece of MDF. Now I didn't film the whole building process of the jig because it wasn't that complicated but as you can see I just glued these uh, supports on and then I glued and screwed a piece of wood either side of this which was the width of the rail and I added some toggle clamps down as you can see there uh, to hold the curve on the jig. So this jig enabled me to cut a profile on the end of the curves now I explain a bit later in more detail how important this curve needed to be uh, but basically I was um, cutting a, a profile on the end of the curves to match uh, the leg I turned. I, uh, I cut this in multiple passes because I'm cutting away end grain and as you can see there that was the profile the spindle molder cut. It was a very nice subtle curve which matched the, the turned leg. So I had four sides to do, each side of both curved rails and uh, I moved the fence back each time to cut a little bit more material away until I cut just the right amount of material. Now this had a lot of setting up to do. I had to make sure the jig was perfectly square and, that, uh, and I had to make sure that the rail wasn't twisted because however I cut this profile on the end is uh, the direction the leg is going to go. So if this profile is slightly off, the leg will be sticking out to the left or the right or forward or backwards. It had to be completely in line with the, with the rail and completely square so the leg pointed straight down. 
and uh, it was a lot of work but in the end we got it done and I'm very happy with how it came out. So I just want to explain how important the connection between the leg and the rail is and how accurate I needed to be. So the spindle moulder cutter I got looked like this and that radius on that cutter was 25mm and that made a groove into a piece of wood like this and that groove would match up to a circle where obviously the diameter would be 50mm. So now what I've got is I've got the curved rails with this profile on the end with a 25mm radius and that would fit the leg that would go onto the end. Now obviously I don't want a gap anywhere between the connection so what I had to do when I was making the leg I had to turn and sand the leg to just over 50mm so the diameter on all the legs ended up being 5.25 about mil sorry centimeters now the reason I wanted to go slightly over is because I wanted there to be no gap on this side here because that is the most visible side now if I draw a bird's eye view of the connection between the rail and the leg with the leg diameter being slightly over the connection would look something like this there's the rail and the curve this is an exaggerated drawing but since making this leg have a bigger diameter than this curve obviously the points of this profile will touch the leg and there'll be a gap in the middle. So down this long side of the rail and the leg, there'll be no gap at all, but there'll be a tiny gap at the top. If the leg was too small, then the profile would look something like this, where the rail profile will be too big for the leg, and then there'll be a massive gap between the leg and the rail. So I wanted to be slightly over with this little gap. But because the rail profile has these two peaks, here and here, there's a very little amount of wood. It's a tiny bit more flexible than obviously the wood over here. So when I get to gluing the leg onto the rail and clamping it in, these peaks can sort of push back a tiny bit, making this gap close up. So in the end, there was no gap at all because the profile pushed back and squeeze the leg into place. So, so this gap was noticeable and this gap was very tight. All right, so now that's over and done with. I hope I explained that well. Now it's time to cut the other curve onto the rails. Now in part two, when I made these curved rails, I explained that not only do the rails curve inwards, they also curve upwards like a bridge. So what I'm doing now is just cutting a template on the bandsaw and I'm gonna sand it back to the line on the disc sander. Now this is quite a subtle curve, but it's just enough and it's actually exaggerated when you look at the table because the curve is also going inwards, uh, it makes the curve going upwards more exaggerated and it looks like it's curving more than it actually is. So you don't want to make this curve too big because when you have two curves kind of, kind of acting together, they exaggerate them both. Uh, so they've both got to be subtle to get the right effect you want. So now the template is all sanded, I'm using a clamp to clamp it down onto the rails and I had to do a lot of lining up and now I'm just tracing out with a pencil on the top and bottom because they're curved uh, on both sides. I had to position this template very carefully on both rails because I was actually cutting uh, the rails out from these, from these curves in different locations uh, because because on the bottom of one of the rails there was a bit of a defect and on the top of the other there was a bit of a defect so I want to avoid those so I position the template slightly different on each uh, rail to get the best grain and the best colour match as possible now it's time to cut the arcs on the bandsaw now as you can see as I'm cutting this I'm tilting the wood down and I'm arcing it as I go along and that was for safety reasons and also control reasons. I don't want any vibration. Uh, where the bandsaw blade is cutting, the wood should always be on the table. If I fed it in the other way or fed it in where the blade was cutting something mid-air, that would be very bad because there'd be a lot of vibration. It might even slam the wood down onto the table and you wouldn't get a nice cut. So you had to be very careful, go very slowly 
and uh, arc the piece of wood as you go along. Now the bandsaw didn't leave the best finish because it was quite a low TPI blade so I had a lot of sanding to do. Uh, for the outside of the curve I could use a flat piece of wood but for the inside I had to sand a profile on a block of wood uh, to match that. So obviously I can sand the inside of a curve like a bobbin sander would. And uh, to check that there were no bumps I was running my fingers along the surface uh, and that allowed me to check that everything was all even and smooth and if there were some raised bits then I could sand that, that area that was high. There was a lot of sanding during this, a bit like to sand those faces of the curves it took three days. This didn't take as long because it was a much smaller amount of area, definitely under a day. But there you could see me running my fingers along the surface and it felt smooth and I was ready to move on to the next step which was adding a chamfer onto each of the corners of the curved rails. Now again this chamfer matched the curve on the side supports and the curve I just put on top of the legs. I did this in multiple passes raising the bit up each time because this is again curly maple and I didn't want it to chip and uh, luckily I didn't have any chip chip out. Uh, the only bit I had an issue with was right at the end as you can see I couldn't go to the end of the curve because uh, the the base of the router would fall off and then it might route it too much off the end so I had to leave the ends uh, with no chamfer and I just did that with a hand plane and a chisel to match the curve and that turned out alright in the end and um, uh, it wasn't noticeable that I switched between a router and a hand plane because I did a bit of sanding as well and everything blended nicely together Now it's time to test fit everything. This isn't the final assembly because I had to take everything apart again and add glue in the joins. But uh, this was just to prep everything and drill the holes in the right place. So I got a bit of parcel tape and uh, taped the leg onto the curve. As you can see there is a pile of wood underneath the leg lifting it up at the right height. I just kept on stacking pieces of the wood together until I got exactly the right height I needed uh, for the leg to be and uh, I added a lot of parcel tape on it and I did a lot of masking out you probably can't see the marking lines on the, on the parcel tape but there are a lot of uh, score lines and dots so I could know so I knew exactly where to drill I drilled a 10 mil hole uh, for the screw head to go in and then I just got a smaller drill bit for the pilot hole and uh, I drilled as far as I can go uh, as you can see there, it couldn't go all the way through because the drill bit wasn't long enough. So I had to take the leg off, take all the, the parcel tape off, so then I can drill that extra bit out with uh, the smaller drill bit. As you can see there, they're the holes that uh, the drill bit got to, and then I just needed to make them deeper. And then it was time to test fit the leg on. This wasn't the final assembly. Uh, I do that all the end where I add glue in all the joints, but I just wanted to see how the leg fits. So I added screws in all the holes and uh, I made them protrude uh, about three mil. Uh, so that helped me locate the screws in the holes. As you can see, the screws slightly protrude and I put them in the gap and uh, then, I was able, then I was able to screw it in. Now the drill wasn't able to get the screw all the way into the hole so I had to finish it off with a screwdriver. Uh, even if the drill did I would still stop it halfway because you get much more control with the screwdriver and I wanted to hand tighten it to fit uh, so there was no risk of going too far or damaging the wood at all uh, with the power drill. Now as you can see here because the screws aren't in all the way there is a gap between the rail and the leg. So as you can see, as I tighten these screws, that gap starts to close very nicely at the top there. And then uh, in the end, there is no visible gap between them. And that is exactly the join I wanted when I designed this table. And I'm absolutely thrilled with how it's come out. I wasn't sure if I'd be able to achieve it. And uh, when I tested all these pieces together for the first time, I thought I was so happy and I, I just sort of I was able to picture uh, what the whole table would look like in the end 
and uh, I was happy all my hard work paid off. So I just had to do that uh, four more times, keep on drilling the holes. As you can see there, I was using a screw to uh, knock off all the sawdust because uh, the, the drill bit got jammed a few times because I was drilling into end grain. So if you put it out halfway and knock off all the sawdust, uh, the drill is a bit easier on the drill bit. And as you can see here, as I'm tightening the screws again, that gap closed up very nicely. And it was so satisfying each time I uh, screwed the screws in to see uh, that gap close up. So once all the legs were screwed on and all the holes were drilled out for that, I had to set up the curved rails and the side rails together to drill those holes. And now this took hours to set up. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of marking lines, so I knew exactly where to drill the hole. But uh, what was most important was I had to add clamps in a lot of different areas to make sure that the rails were on straight and that the profile on the end was square to the table, so then the legs would be pointing directly downwards. I wanted to make sure that the, uh, the top of the wings on the side rails were all level, so the glass would sit flat. I wanted to make sure that the, the walls on the side rails were square and it just took a very long time to get that all set up but once it was set up I was able to drill out all the holes. Now those holes were between the side rails and the curved rails. As you can see that the holes sort of have flared edges. That is caused by when you're screwing a screw in uh, the wood starts to lift up a bit around the hole and uh, that could cause a gap between the two pieces. So what I did was I got a uh, countersink bit to uh, remove that flared area. That enabled uh, the side rail and the curved rail to join very tightly together and then there was no possibility of a gap. That is the profile on the end of the curves as you can see there. And there all the pieces ready to glue together. That's the coopering on the curved rails. You can see all the ripples showing very nicely. There the legs uh, the, with the screws already in. And that is the logo on top of one of the legs. As you can see, it's come out very nicely. And uh, as you can see here, I used my leg to tighten the vise. I think that was very skillful of me. As you can see there, I put a little bit of glue uh, between the rail and the leg. I didn't want to put too much because I really didn't want any squeeze out at all because that that's a nightmare when you're adding a finish. I don't want any glue to be shown or, or be able to scrape away and um, there was no squeeze out which was good. Later on I plugged those holes so you won't be able to see the screws. I plugged those holes with uh, Paduk. As you can see there that is the joint closing up for the final time. This was the plug cutter I was using. This plug cutter is quite special. It's very blunt, so it took a very long time to cut them, but it still worked very well. Um, it made tapered plugs so that whatever size hole you drilled, uh, it, the plug would sit very nicely and it wouldn't go all the way in because it was tapered, but you're sure to have a nice join when, when you flush the, uh, the dowel off. So I just put some glue in the gap, uh, smudged it around with a piece of veneer to coat all the walls and I hammed it in with a soft blow mallet. Now I just put some masking tape on top of the plug just to eliminate any risk of the plug overnight kind of squeezing out or moving a bit. I didn't want any risk of that so I just wrapped it in masking tape to force it in as much as I could. And I was doubting if I wanted to use Paduk for the plugs uh, I thought, is there too much Paduk in the piece? Uh, is there too much orange? But I'm very happy I did it in the end. I really think the contrast between that red and white work really well. And if I did any other wood, I think it would just ruin it. The only w other wood I could do would be the maple, but then I think it would look like I'm trying to hide the plugs, uh, and uh, I'm not trying to hide them, and it might make it look worse if I'm trying to hide some dowels. So I like that they're obvious, that there's some red dots. It shows off the joinery well, and uh, I think it's come out really nicely. Now to flush trim the protruding dowels, I used Ed's Japanese pool saw. Thank you very much, Ed. And uh, that enabled me to get back closer to 
the leg and then I finished it off pairing with a chisel. Uh, you could do it with a violin plane or a small block plane. I have a, I think I have a little bit more control with the chisel. Maybe not, I, I, maybe I should have tried a plane, but uh, I was able to nibble away small bits with the chisel and I could see what I was planing. Instead of a plane, you have you know, kind of the soul to deal with. Um, but anyway, as you can see here, I am pre-finishing the side rails. Uh, just added a couple of coats of Osmo oil because it would be much easier to finish it now before I glue it onto the curved rails. If I did it after, I'd have to get right into the corner and into that curve where my thumb is now, and that would be too difficult. Uh, so I pre-finished those bits, and then once the whole table was put together, then I could uh, finish everything else. I can finish the curved rails and the legs in one go. Now I added a bit of glue onto that surface. I didn't do too much. Uh, there was only a little bit of squeeze out on this area, um, but that was easy to wipe up. And as you can see, that gap closes up now when the screws are fully driven in all the way. And uh, then I needed to flip the table around. As you can see, I've got the glass slab ready there. Uh, I put a, I'll put a link in the description down below to that glass company if you're based in Oxford. They have a great glass surface, they can do any shape you like at a good price, so uh, I'll put their link in the description down below. And here I have pre-screwed in the screws, they protrude a little bit on the other side so I can drive them all in in one go. I put a bit of glue on each side rail ready to go and this bit was very exciting, I can finally screw everything all together. I put the protruding screws in the holes and then I just needed to drive all the screws in all the way and uh, that was the table complete. As you can see it looks a bit wobbly but believe it or not that is actually the floor is very uneven. Uh, if I, as I moved the table around the workshop some areas it didn't wobble, some areas it did. Uh, it wasn't perfectly flat, the, the floor really exaggerated it because the floor wasn't flat. So to level all the legs what I did was I put the table on the jointer bed which I know is perfectly flat and then I was able to just sand off the two high legs very subtly and that a and that made it not wobble so it was keep on going back and forth onto uh, the jointer bed uh, taking off the high sanding off the high points of the legs and then uh, the table didn't wobble anymore and uh, here you can see me adding the final dowels into the hole. I had to drill more plugs uh, with the dowel cutter. And here I'm just using a flush cut saw because I wanted it. I wanted a bendy saw to match the curve of the curved rail. And believe it or not, it actually didn't mark the curved rail. Uh, I'm normally quite worried about a flush cut saw actually scratching the surface around the dowel. Some people put masking tape around it, but uh, this time it, it didn't. And I used a chisel and as you can see here the orbital sander to sand it back. And yeah, that is pretty much the table all assembled. And uh, in the next video I'll be adding the glass on. And this is the glass. Uh, the shop in Oxford is called ANC Services. As you can see there, there are a lot of other pieces of glass that other people have awarded. They do doors, windows, tabletops, staircases. So, so check them out if you're in the local area. I'll put all their information in the description down below. Right, and there we go. It's quite a long video. That is pretty much the table assembled, so I hope you're liking how it's coming together. In the next part, the final part of this series, everything is going to be done. I'm going to add the finish onto the table. I'm going to be showing you the whole process from the beginning to the end. Don't worry, it won't be an hour-long video. I'm going to shrink it down to as short as I can to show you very quickly the whole build process. It should be a really fun video where you can see in one video the whole thing to come together. I think eight weeks worth of work 
in a 10 minute video should be really fun to watch. As always, if you want to see the other parts of this series, they will be linked down below. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you managed to stick to the end, well done. That's This will be one of the longest videos I've ever done. And yeah, if you did enjoy it, give it a like. If you've got any questions or you just want to chat, comment down below. I will reply to all your comments. And if you're new to the channel, feel free to subscribe. And if you want to support the channel, I'd really appreciate it if you support me on Patreon. All the information about that will be in the description down below. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll see you in the next one. I'd like to love you, love you. I'd like to love you, love you.